Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, family. Welcome to the Mental House with me, your illustrious host, Khadija. I'm not going to spend too much time talking because this scholar is going to hit everything I think that needs to be said um, about the empire that we call America. And um, you can't dispute it. Here we go. I mean, this is a typical pathology of the United States, to be honest. If you have something that they want, if you have something that they need, then they hate you. They demean you and they dehumanize you. You're not just an enemy to them. You're not even human. They need you to not be human. Uh, so that they can morally justify to themselves all of the cruelty and the brutality that they will employ against you uh, to exploit you, to use you, and to uh, pillage whatever you have that they want. Because they want to be able to enslave and abuse you in good conscience. The most obvious example, of course, is slavery. But of course, that was just one, maybe the most acute and the most grotesque form of dehumanization that they did. But this is, this is just their way. You know, from the enslaved Africans, they wanted their labor, uh, and they wanted the wealth that was produced by their labor. Now, other nations had slaves. The Muslims had slaves too, but no one else in history, no one else in the world, assigned slaves subhuman status. As I've talked about before, uh, slaves in the Muslim world could rise to an even higher socioeconomic status than their masters. In the Muslim world, the slave and the owner were brothers, but in America... The slave was considered a beast of burden, and the owner of the slave was a sadistic beast master. Now, they needed it to be this way. They needed it to be this way because fundamentally, uh, they do not know how uh, or do not believe in peaceful, equitable transactions. They don't believe in mutual benefit. Mutual benefit to them represents some kind of loss for them. They don't believe in harmonious relations, fair transactions, fair exchange, and all of that. They believe in conquest. America was built on stolen land and sustained by stolen labor. And it has a long-standing habit, a tradition, of dehumanizing those who possess what it desires. So for the African slaves, they were dehumanized for their labor, for the sweat and tears that built the foundation of a nation claiming freedom for all. But they had to dehumanize them in order to make that claim, you see. Because they wanted to be able uh, to pretend that they were good, righteous, enlightened people who believed that all men are created equal. But they also wanted to continue treating African slaves as less than human, as less than equal. So they had to invent this idea that, well, they're not fully human. So therefore it doesn't count. It wasn't a violation of their principles to treat beasts of burden as unequal. By dehumanizing them, they were able to convince themselves that chattel slavery didn't contradict with their claims of virtue. Or you can look at the Native Americans. The indigenous inhabitants of that land for centuries were dehumanized for the richness beneath their feet, for the land. They were pushed to the margins. Their cultures were erased. The lands that they held sacred were violated. All for America's insatiable, ruthless hunger for more, for expansion, for dominance. They don't understand the idea of coexistence, of peace and harmony. They believe in the philosophy of the last man standing. That's their approach to the world. First within uh, what's now the territorial United States, and then the entire Western Hemisphere, and then to the whole planet. This is what they applied. Mexico, Central America, South America, you see the Latin Americans, their natural resources were sought, and so their sovereignty was trampled upon. America's pursuit of what it desires has always been characterized by exploitation, domination, and subjugation. For all their talk about capitalism and the market, you know, free exchange and so on, for all their talk about this, it's not what they practice, it's not what they fundamentally believe. For them, uh, capitalism means we make the money, we make the profit, we benefit. Everything is ours and nothing is yours. Well, that's not capitalism. It's barbarism. It's piracy. You can't go into a business deal or a negotiation with that mentality. 
That's the mentality that you have when you commit a bank robbery, not a business agreement. But you see, they can't admit to themselves uh, that they're actually just glorified pirates, glorified mafiosos, marauders, because they have a need to believe about themselves that they're good, enlightened, civilized people. So the only way that they can uh, reconcile their barbaric instincts uh, with their need to believe in their own goodness is by dehumanizing everyone else, dehumanizing everyone who has what they want, and they want everything. The United States is the only country in the world uh, who literally and seriously believes that control over the entire planet is vital to their national interests. Imagine. And we've gotten used to American dominance. We think the world actually has to operate like this. We imagine uh, that there's no other way for international relations to be carried out except by means of hege uh, hegemonic power. If you're looking for a house, you should be looking for a mortgage. Mm. Mm. That's not correct. Just because one country uh, or even a few countries have more power than others, that does not necessarily mean or automatically mean that everyone else just has to kowtow to them and be exploited and be pushed around and do as they're told. It doesn't have to be like that. That's a Western model. And it originates uh, from the Western psyche, which developed uh, through their own peculiar history and their own peculiar culture. Not everyone is like that. In fact, most people aren't like that. Are you like that? Of course not. It's abnormal. The truth is that even most average Westerners, most average Americans are not like that. And I think it's even uh, less and less prevalent now among the common people in the United States, precisely because their own government, uh, their own elites are now dehumanizing even them, subjugating even them, treating uh, their own citizens as a subcategory of the human race who deserve to be exploited and disposed of after use. That's how the West and how America is treating its own people now, not just the global South. And yes, it's abnormal, it's pathological, it's sick. And most people, uh, even uh, most states around the world, are not like that. There's something wrong with you. I mean, China is not like that. China, by most metrics, uh, is the largest economy in the world. It's a global superpower, not a regional one. It's a global superpower. But it's not trying to dominate and subjugate the planet. The Chinese approach uh, to international relations is compatible uh, with the historic Muslim approach to international relations. This is why we get along. This, this approach is one of harmony, mutual benefit, uh, bilateral and multilateral cooperation. They don't feel uh, that they're losing money if both of you make money. They don't regard uh, your prosperity or the prosperity of others as a threat to their own prosperity. They believe in mutually profitable transactions. You know, for the Chinese, if you have something uh, that they want, if you have something that they need, well, that makes you important to them. It makes you someone that they want to get along with. It doesn't make you an enemy. It doesn't make you, uh, or it doesn't make them want to invade and colonize you. And understand, this isn't necessarily uh, based on any particular mor uh, morality or moral principles. It's just simple uh, practicality. It's good business. If you wage war on a country, then only some segments of your economy will benefit from that. You know, weapons companies, uh, reconstruction-related industries, and so on. But there are huge segments of, uh, segments of your economy which will suffer uh, because of war. To the average Chinese business person, when they see casualty figures from, say, the war in Iraq or uh, wherever else, they see uh, from those casualty figures, well, that's just that many more people who will not be customers that we could have sold to because they're dead. That doesn't make practical sense. That's not good business sense. Forget about the moral right and wrong of it, just from a practical business perspective. Uh, casualties of war don't go shopping. I mean, until recently, the U.S. economy was war-driven. It was the military-industrial complex. Uh, that was the driver of the American economy. But uh, manufacturing as a percentage of the U.S. economy has declined considerably uh, since Eisenhower uh, first talked about the military-industrial complex. Things have changed a lot. I think it's, it's reduced from around 32% uh, to less than 10%. And about today, about 90% of American manufacturing is not connected to the U.S. military. That means that other business sectors have greater influence than they used to. Business sectors that may not necessarily benefit from war, and but could actually be hurt by war. 
And as the domestic uh, economic dynamics have changed, uh, as you know, so too have the domestic power dynamics with the rise of private sector power and the uh, globalization of private sector power to where now the uh, owners and controls of global financialized capital are no longer tied to American prosperity. In other words, the old American model of domination and subjugation uh, is not as appealing as it used to be because the OCGFC have more diverse interests around the world. And I think that they, uh, being profit-driven and being practical, are going to uh, be inclining more and more towards the Chinese approach to international affairs, the Muslim approach to international affairs, the BRICS approach to international affairs. And I think that's what's happening. Because, yes, uh, there will always be a segment of, say, Larry Fink's portfolio of BlackRock clients who can profiteer in the wake of war. But at this point, I think that there's a far greater proportion uh, of clients in his portfolio who won't benefit from war and who would be harmed, and whose, whose interests would be harmed by war. And that means the death of Washington neocons. So the military-industrial complex created a monster, the neocons, the neoconservatives in Washington, uh, whose policy proposals for in, any, any kind of international policy proposals always involve bombing. So they created this monster, but now... Uh, that monster is redundant. It's obsolete. It's become a liability. But it's like an old uh, device that cannot uh, support a software upgrade. They can't adapt to the new political and economic landscape. So you still have these uh, dinosaurs like Victoria Nuland uh, calling for war with Iran, for example. But the OCGFC, in my opinion, do not want a war with Iran. So you have this comical exchange that took place, that uh, reportedly took place between the U.S. and Iran uh, during talks in Switzerland, where they were telling Iran, uh, let us conduct some attacks inside of Iran just for show, basically to appease the dying wishes of the neocons on their deathbed, but please don't retaliate, we don't mean it. Just let us do some attacks, and we won't escalate after that. And of course, Iran said, well, uh, no, if you attack us, we will regard it as an act of war, and we will retaliate against your bases in the Middle East. Of course, uh, attacks against U.S. bases in the Middle East will mean the destruction of everything that BRICS and the OCGFC and BlackRock have planned for the region. So no, uh, Washington, I don't think, is going to get the approval for that. So then Biden is left uh, with the only way to appease the neocons uh, being to attack Iranian assets outside of Iran, attack them in Iraq and in Syria and so on. So you see how they're getting put in check? Because the global power dynamics have changed and the U.S. is being forced now to try to adapt. And it's an entirely new experience for them. And they're adapting badly. Because again, uh, it's, just, it's just not their nature. They're offended uh, at any constraints on their belligerence. They're indignant at the idea that the whole world should not just offer them tribute and gratefully subordinate themselves to American power. They can't stand it. They can't, it doesn't compute in their minds. This is a habit of thinking uh, that predates their actual power, and then having power just made it worse. And I don't think that anyone, um, uh, most of all the OCGFC, believe that they can ever change. And that's why I think America is gradually being sidelined and being abandoned by the global elite. Because they're incapable of updating their software. They're incapable of updating their mentality. And they're incapable of civilizing. Because... Uh, having had the ability to impose their will around the world meant that they never had to civilize. And they don't actually possess any internal motivation to do so, and they never did. So ultimately, uh, I think that they're going to be left behind. And it's starting to dawn on them, I think, that they're being left behind. Uh, but at the moment, I think they're still in denial. I think they're in denial. I mean, because, look, practically speaking, how exactly are you supposed to ever dial back uh, from dehumanizing whole nations? whole countries, whole populations, and then uh, treat them and expect to be treated by them in any kind of normal way. I mean, again, look at the situation inside the U.S. with African Americans. Until today, uh, the racial situation in that country isn't normal. They still don't know how to deal with each other in any kind of a normal way. And the same applies now for the rest of the world and the U.S. Their relations with the rest of the world is very similar uh, to their relations between the former slave owners and the former slaves. Because you dehumanize people. And how are you supposed to get past that? How are you supposed to get that out of your own mind? And how are they supposed to get it out of their own mind about you? It's very difficult.
So now the same uh, dynamic, the same dysfunction uh, is going to potentially permanently uh, play America's relations with the rest of the planet. I mean, in some ways, you could say that BRICS, the BRICS countries, are almost performing a kind of a, uh, an intervention, like with a, an alcoholic or a drug addict. The U.S. is reaching rock bottom, uh, and BRICS is performing an intervention to force them to see, to face what they really are and how they really are, and forcing them to see the way they're going to have to be if they want to recover any kind of respectable role in the world. But until now, I think the U.S. is in denial. They can't face it. You know, Europe is kind of like that last friend of a drug addict who sticks by them until the end, until finally the addict steals from them and lies to them and betrays them too, and eventually they'll lose even that friend. You know, it's like that song says, America is uh, smoking all of its friends down to the filter, and the inevitable reckoning is coming, and it's going to be hard. But by the time it comes, I don't think anyone will really be interested, uh, because by that time, the world will have already moved on. No. Woo! Woo! I hope y'all suck that up. I hope we understood exactly what the scholar, well, the brave Arab scholar at this point was trying to say about the American elite. You know, um, final realization is we on our last leg. If that's the only thing that Trump says that makes any sense, but he don't know he started the house. Of, uh, he he's he started the quick rock rocket ship launch of the descent to hell. We were already spiraling out of control and on our way to hell because of all the drama that we produced prior to Donald Trump. Okay then a country like America could produce something like Donald Trump is what self, you know, it's just self revelant And I thank that scholar. I thank him because the truth will set you free. All right. I want to know what y'all think about it. Let me know how you feel about that information. Do you agree or do you disagree? Okay. I'll see you in the next video. Oh, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.